Yes, and uh, we continue to cure the country of wokeism. Um, boy, some major um, shifts in progress in that. Look, I'm getting a, a flood of emails from people who are involved in the protest as we look back on the year anniversary, and we look yesterday at a day that you would hardly believe would have happened a year ago. Um, with a new Prime Minister, a whole lot of policies being thrown on the bonfire, and perhaps a year on, you can say that the river of filth had its point, and maybe it changed the world and the flow of events in New Zealand. Uh, this text lost a few friends as I supported the protest, had a scroll of complaints against the government ready to roll out if I'd gone to Wellington, still banging my drum about productive New Zealand farmland being sold off to international buyers to plant pines to, and carry on polluting the BS scheme. Um, thank you for that. And look, one of the policies rolled back yesterday, we've talked already about the, um, uh, about the TVNZ, RNZ merger. The last vestiges of, and, and personally for me, the most, one of the most appalling aspects of, of Jacinda Ardern's government, the, the unhealthy desire to um, suppress the free speech of New Zealanders and to prescribe what we could say and make speaking your mind in this country uh, a crime. Uh, the last vestiges of that were kicked for consultation to the Law Commission, which means too hard basket. We aren't going to do it in the foreseeable future. And I saw on social media our friend from the Free Speech Union, uh, Union Jonathan Ailing, saying, Victory, um, what a great thing. He joins us now. Well, Jonathan, does this mean you guys pack up your tent and you go home? Certainly not, no. <laughs> Though we are going to take a moment to celebrate uh, what what a significance back down this is. You know, uh, for the Free Speech Union, May 2021 was when we shifted from being the coalition to the union, and then these hate speech laws were announced about a month later. And so they've kind of been with us ever since I came on board. And when, when we first set up the campaign against them you know we were up against the majority government and and a lot of support for these laws and so minister of justice at the time chris farfoy said that they would all be through by christmas 2021 and uh and we managed to knock them back then throughout 2022 we obviously uh saw them back down whittled down to and to kerry allen said she was going to pass them by the end of this term of government didn't she Whatever was well, left. no, no, no. I, I, I rewatched that clip recently because I thought, what were her words there? She said she would introduce them and would hope to have them passed by okay. uh, by this term of government. So no, they've now she, been withdrawn. Her part. They've well, now been fine. withdrawn. And, yeah. And 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 I I, I think uh, th this is the way free speech works. I, I I saw one commentator saying, if Phil Goff, let's go back five years. If Phil Goff had never cancelled Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern, yeah. the Free Speech Coalition would never have been set up. And uh, and what this commentator was saying, if the Free Speech had uh, Free Speech Coalition had never been set up, it's quite possible that uh, these hate speech laws would have gone through. And so it's interesting the way censorship ultimately is its own worst enemy. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think I think there's there's a there's a really ironic argument there that when censorship prevails, ultimately it, it's slithering its own throat. Uh, but I think what we've seen here is across the political spectrum, Kiwis stand up and stand together, really, and say, no, we don't need to be told what we're allowed to say. Hate speech, um, is, uh, they're not a, a, the solution to uh, building more co uh, cohesion in our society. And so we're really pleased with this fact. Um. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, but it, and we might think that for the moment the battle is over. And certainly it would seem to me that, th that there has, Hipkins on these issues at least, represents a real change. But I still look, and we had a discussion yesterday with the, um, with the Race Relations uh, Commissioner, Ming Foon, and I had read through a report that had been produced by them, which once again featured the issue of disinformation and mm. the disinformation project, who are still, if you like, in the background, creating a censorious attitude amongst government departments and telling people they should be wary of what other people say even uh, innocently and should be reporting them for speaking freely. This doesn't mean that the battle for freedom of speech is over, does it? 
Well, Sean, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. The battle for free speech is not primarily fought on the steps of Parliament. And, and, and that's why we can say this is a big victory, but there's no way we're packing up and going anywhere. Because the fight for free speech has to be, first and foremost, a cultural one. And certainly you point out the Human Rights Commission. They uh, have a lot to answer for, frankly, in the way that they refuse to acknowledge the most basic of human rights for humans, which is uh, the freedom of conscience and freedom yeah. of, of expression. And Jonathan, I'd also add, uh, and I'd, I'd invite you to listen to the interview with Ming Fing, because the report itself says, we got a lot of different views, but we're not going to publish in our report any views that we just dis didn't disagree with. We're just going to label them racist. That's right. And, and what you do then is you take... Uh, dialogue and you take conversation, robust and, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, offensive conversation, but, but you take it off the table and people feel like they don't have other options than to take more demonstrable forms of expression. And, and, and so that's why at the cultural level, whether it's the commission, whether it's in our universities, whether it's in our uh, media station, we've got a, a, a packed uh, work schedule for the year, and this back down doesn't change any of that yeah. because we're going to the, we're trying to get to the root of where this antagonism to free speech is emerging. Where uh, in the past New Zealand has been a far more tolerant society, and I wouldn't say that was because people necessarily thought the same ways. You look across our history, there have always been difficult issues. And, and we haven't always done free speech well. I'm not, I'm not saying mm. that's the case either. But I'm saying while free speech has been left on the table, we've been able to navigate those differences without shrinking into uh, echo chambers and actually, you know, fearing yeah. that the other side is going to turn violent. Mm. And that's where we're at now. You see m more and more people, and uh, people from opposite sides of the perspective agreeing that the polarization we see emerging has the potential to turn into uh, instances of violence yeah. and at the very least into, in, 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 into uh, really nasty encounters. Yeah. Or, 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 or Jonathan, and here's a more optimistic view. We are a year on from the parliamentary protest and I've had people and I've asked people who took part to look back and see how they feel about it today. And it was, it, it was certainly in mainstream media at the time, painted as an evil insurrection against the government and the people wanted to hang people and they were terrorists and they were uh, white supremacists and they were Nazis. A year on, most of the things the people on Parliament in a rather chaotic way were demanding have come to pass. Jacinda is gone. Trevor is no longer the Speaker. A lot of unpopular policies and mandates and stuff have been abandoned. And I wonder, rather than getting all upset about something like the parliamentary occupation, we don't say actually it was pretty moderate by international standards and it was in fact an expression of a freedom of speech for a group of people who felt they were being excluded. Absolutely, and, and, and it shows, once again, good old people power. You know, uh, Sean, I think you were down at those protests. I, uh, I, I never stayed there, but I went and I spoke with some people there to hear what they had to say. And you can't tell me that there wasn't a New Zealand of every stripe there. And, and you can agree, you can disagree with, with how that protest ended, yeah. but there were people there with very legitimate concerns. And, and I don't see how, um, you know, I, I, th th this, this may sound like like a soapbox, but, you know, elite perspectives, the lanyard-wearing class that think they can so easily dismiss the voices of everyday Kiwis, I think they learned something that day. But maybe they didn't, actually. Maybe they haven't learned from it. And, and that's where I, I don't know. what you, you say we've seen Trevor gone, we've seen Jacinda gone, we've seen these policy changes. Have we actually seen them learn that... that listening to fellow Kiwis really matters, though? You know, uh, yesterday in Rotorua... Uh, council, a policy was passed that allows the council to vet submissions to the council so that if uh, they deem a submission on a policy question to the council to be vexatious or offensive, they can just block it. This is the sort of thing that shows to me Whoa. we actually have, we have to get to the heart of the issue and go you, go, you don't get to pick and choose. 
what Kiwis views, who you represent, get the same. And yeah. you know what? At the end of the day, those Kiwis, may, they, they may not carry the day. That's fine. They still get to have their say. And so I, I hear what you're saying, Sean. I think we need to look more in, in, in depth into really uh, whether we're making progress in the space, though, or maybe it's just coming to a head. And that gives us a chance to address it. Yeah. And I know you've got a movie coming about. We're going to talk about that on the program uh, next week. Uh, Jonathan, um, the movie project or the documentary project that you guys have been working on, we'll, we'll save that for another day. Could I oh, just say... I'll, 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 I'll... I'll, I'll give you. I'll give your audience just this little little teaser, though. Uh, there's nothing like working with the producer, who at the beginning of this week had finally finished the last draft. We had dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, and then he said, "Crap, I have to go back in there and change it again because Chris Hipkins dropped the hate speech law." So we were pleased. Oh, to, so uh, you're doing some late change. editing just as well. We're doing we, it next we, week. <laughs> we were pleased to have to change the ending of that story. Yeah, um, but it is not. It's not over yet, Jonathan. I congratulate you and your compadres uh, for the work you've done on, on what I consider one of the most important issues of our time. Thank you once again uh, for coming on the platform, mate. Um, we'll see you next week. That is Jonathan Ayling from the Free Speech Union. And, yeah, he says we look back at the protest a year on a legitimate expression from a group of frustrated New Zealanders and a cross-section of New Zealanders uh, a legitimate exercising of their free speech. Uh, this from Nell. The parliamentary protest was a beautiful event that made me feel proud to be a Kiwi for the first time in a long time. It also opened my eyes to the lies of MSM and the then PM. Life-changing. Wow, life-changing, says Nell.